Thank you very much, Agnes, and thank you for joining us. I know you have to uh, get back to your office, so thank you for sparing us the time. And you raised some very thought-provoking things, which are maybe the themes of this conference. And with what I'm going to say in my little speech now, we'll develop that theme. So thank you again. So delegates and, and honoured guests and friends, welcome again to the second FIM, International Orchestras Conference. Um, just a little bit about myself, first of all. Um, prior to my second career as a trade union official with the British Musicians Union, I was for 25 years a professional orchestral musician. So this is the part of our broad music profession that I personally relate to and why I'm looking forward to all of the debates that we're going to have over the next few days with eager anticipation. And many of you were there three years ago at the inaugural International Orchestras Conference in Berlin. And like me, I'm sure you remember what a fantastic occasion that was. For the first time, we gathered together the people that make up our orchestras, the musicians themselves. At that time, I told the delegates that I've attended, during my uh, second career, many orchestra conferences. In fact, I attended the uh, Association of British Orchestras conferences about two weeks ago. The constant of all of these conferences is the lack of musicians that are present. Uh, there's no actual participation from the players, or very little participation. If I wanted to be unkind, I'd say it's almost as if the musicians' opinions are not particularly valued. Um, I'm sure that in the vast majority of orchestras this is not the case. However, there seems to exist still a kind of patronising, old-fashioned attitude within a number of orchestras that I know of, that the management and the board knows best. You people do a great job, just play your instruments and we'll make the policy decisions on your behalf. I'm sure lots of you, uh, that rings true with lots of you. Of course, this is an exaggeration. Uh, but it never ceases to amaze me that when, when I hear of the us and them school of industrial relations that exists in lots of our orchestras. Well, this conference is the once every three years opportunity to remedy that, so I'm looking forward to hearing you. Having said that, I'm very pleased to welcome the uh, number of orchestra managers and administrators who are joining us for the first day and a half of this conference. These are the good guys. And I hope they gain something that they'll be able to take back to their own colleagues through listening to the views and the opinions of the worldwide community of professional musicians that we represent. Well, like Agnes said, the economic and political climate is quite different from what it was only three years ago when we met in Berlin. There's been a global financial crisis wrought on by a banking system that encouraged greed through speculation. And now we all have to pay the price. You know, I'm sure you'll agree with me that times have always been hard for orchestras. And those of you that were in Berlin will uh, probably recollect an extremely interesting presentation by Pamela Rosenberg, who is an American national, but at that time was in at the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra. And during her presentation, she compared the two funding systems, the USA system, based on philanthropy and, and private giving, and the European system, which is mainly based on public subsidy. She concluded that there was merit in both systems, but in most cases, except for an elite few, orchestras across the world were, and still are, chronically underfunded. Well, as we know, both of these systems have been dealt dealt hammer blows in many countries, as on the one hand governments, mainly of the centre-right, have reduced subsidies, and on the other hand corporate sponsors are retrenching because of the pressure on their own businesses and industries. Even where we have more benign governments, and I'll use the example of the USA here, where the Obama administration has been seen to be relatively friendly to trade unions, uh, we're seeing attacks on the fundamental rights of trade unionists, and that includes musicians. And let me single out America once more and what's happening in Wisconsin and Utah. And can I take this opportunity of sending our best wishes from this conference to our colleagues in the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, who are now in their 23rd, I think, week of a very serious strike and a bitter dispute with their management. So, AFM, please take those back to, uh, to our colleagues there. So... Well, it's, uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> By the way, you'll be hearing more of that. We've got some information uh, leaflets that uh, our colleagues have brought with, us, with them. So, this is the serious situation. And while it's not the fault 
of the second violins that the world economy collapsed, it looks like in many of our countries, them and their colleagues are going to have to disproportionately pay for it. Many of us have tales to tell about how government cuts are going to have a significant effect on our members, and Agnes outlined very briefly what's happening here in the Netherlands. And let me also give you a snapshot of what's happening in my country, the UK. The current Conservative-led coalition government has embarked on a series of savage cuts across the whole of the public sector. This includes hospitals, schools, the police, social services, this list goes on and on. The arts and culture sector, sector has been cut on two fronts. Uh, in England, the Arts Council has been given a 23% cut to its budget, but it's been told to ensure that the important, I use that in inverted commas, regularly funded organisations uh, receive no more than a 15% cut. Now this means that some performing groups will lose their money, their state subsidy, altogether and they'll probably cease operating because of this. We're going to hear the details at the end of this month. The other provider of public subsidy to the arts in the UK, the local governments, have also had to absorb massive cuts. These are now filtering through to the culture sector, and the first of many to suffer are the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic and the City of Birmingham orchestras, who have each received cuts in excess of £300,000 from their city councils. This is on top of the cut from the national public subsidy. At the same time, we're seeing corporate sponsorship falling away because of pressure on their businesses, and this will undoubtedly get worse, particularly in the UK, as many of these uh, organisations want to be associated with the 2012 Olympics in London. So the money that would go into the arts is, going to drift, is already drifting into sport because of the coverage they'll get. And this is for four weeks two weeks in the Paralympics, and it's going to have a massive effect, I think, on our sector. So what I've said is reflected in most parts of the developed world, and this is your chance to uh, make your voice word, uh, heard um, to assist us, the Federation, in formulating our policies. When we talk to organisations around the world, we'll get some international speakers here, but we regularly speak to UNESCO, we regularly speak to uh, organisations like the European Commission, and we need to know what you think. And also, this is your opportunity to talk to and interact with your colleagues. Uh, the networking is very important, but it doesn't mean I'm going to make the breaks any longer for you. Uh, we've designed the programme to encourage as much participation from the delegates as possible. Uh, your panellists have promised to keep their interventions brief, and your moderators will make sure that everybody who wants to gets the chance to speak. Um, that is within the allocated time frames, I have to say. So uh, that's, that may be me looking at my watch. So I apologise in advance if I upset.